So today will be judged by uh, a wonderful pa panel of jurors. Uh, so here in the physical realm, we're uh, joined by uh, Alexander Pollock, uh, the CTO of uh, FX Collaborative and uh, Jason Lee, uh, the acting chairperson uh, of Pratt Institute, uh, the school that probably half of course studio have attended at some point in their lives. And um, also from the limitless expanse of the interwebs, uh, we're also joined by uh, James Wynn, the director of uh, Intelligent Places at Gensler, uh, Corey Brugger, uh, the CTO at uh, HKS, and Cecile Brandt, uh, an engineer at Cecile Brandt Consulting. Um, so, we're about to begin the, uh, the review process. I have all of your presentations. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to join uh, the meeting and share my screen. Uh, if you have team members who are physically present in the office, feel free to come up. Um, well, we don't have a podium, but just come over here. Um, and you're free to use this computer. If you're fully remote, uh, we, you can also just share your screen and do it this way. And uh, if you have any live demos, also feel free to join the meeting and share your screen uh, from a different machine. So uh, to start with, we are happy to introduce the M Luminance. And it will take me a second to actually join the meeting. <laughs> um, but if you guys want to come up here and uh, start setting up. Also, just a friendly reminder, we have about eight teams and roughly an hour. So that leaves us with about six to seven minutes. Um, I went to art school. I don't do math very well, but um, I think that's, uh, that's about the range. Um, so, OK. Are we yeah, good are to go? Guys, are you guys fully remote? We are. OK, well, uh, take it away. Great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so our team name is M Luminance. Uh, we're three of us joining from Bjarke Ingels Group here in uh, Copenhagen. And then Ken is joining uh, from, uh, as a grad student from the University of Tokyo. Next slide. Um, oh, actually, sorry, go back one. That was my fault. Um, and we, we're, we wanted to focus on this idea of instantaneous daylighting. And, and really bring that into the earliest phases of design and, and see if it's possible to uh, bring that into sketch phase. So next, next slide. So we are asking ourselves, um, and we, uh, the problem that we're targeting is, is this problem of communication between daylighting experts and architects where it's difficult to uh, hit annual based criteria or daylighting criteria because the feedback loop is so slow. So we wanted to uh, sort of very uh, precisely target that, that, that sketch phase. Um, so next slide. Oh. So the process that we went uh, with for the last 24 hours, uh, we didn't have that much time. So we had to produce a data set, train the data set, produce um, basically all the back end, and get the user inputs to be called of basically to call that model and then visualize the results back. So those are kind of the steps that we went through. We created a shoebox model that would kind of explore parameter space and produce that data set for us. We use pollination for that, and it's a very useful tool for <laughs> multiprocessing. Uh, we use the UDI calculation, which is notoriously very heavy, um, takes into account all daylight hours of the year. Calibri to iterate through those parameters, TensorFlow for the training, Google Colab, Rhino hops to, cor to connect C Python um, to TensorFlow, and then we visualize all the results in Rhino or Revit. Here's a little GIF, uh, which is in real time, of kind of how fast, let's say, the results can be read in. Um, of course, given the time, the accuracy is sometimes awesome, sometimes it's sketchy, but it's also just from the fault of the data set that was given. Um, but as you can see, it's pretty interactive, and we're hoping that this is kind of a, a door, an open door to sketching with daylight. This was the timeline. Uh, we had to stack a bunch of tasks together, creating the dummy data sets so we can get some, like a structure for training uh, underway, then training the real data set, um, creating a Revit UI, 
building the hops TensorFlow link, um, calling the TensorFlow link, uh, t calling the TensorFlow model through Rhino, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of stuff happened in 24 hours. So um, yeah. And so I'm just a, how we in terms of how we built the uh, base data set for training. It's based on EPW weather data from Copenhagen, where orientation is really important. And because we are focusing on an annual simulation that is notoriously slow, uh, we also wanted to like capture orientation. Um, and so for that, we used Calibri to control how we explored the design space. Uh, orientation was our, our primary uh, variable, and then um, the, the room width and, and shuffling the corners of the, the rooms um, was also explored, right? Uh, next slide. And so we did 950 total runs on pollination servers. Our final training set was 650 simulations. Uh, and it's sort of worth mentioning that we used this feature of um, user input to patch through all of the features that we wanted the machine learning model to uh, be aware of. Ken? So for our TensorFlow model, we use simple characteristics as inputs to describe the room with solid A containing the window. And we outputted the, the UDI results onto a 31 by 30 UDI workspace with zero describing the outdoor conditions so that we don't have to worry about the boundary conditions for the scope of this hackathon. Next slide, please. Uh, the algorithm that we have we applied was the as a general generative neural network model, which can take a one, which is an opposite of the a classical um, image classification neural network model, and it can take a one-dimensional room parameter, project it onto a two-dimensional UDI mesh. Uh, next slide, please. So the accuracy of this model sometimes is really good, um, with a one point five percent average error. Sometimes it would. It, shifted the UDI mesh results because we did not worry about the coordinates or the boundary conditions. Um, but typically, each case can be run in about 0.4 seconds. This was the general workflow of Rhino through hops, calling C Python libraries with TensorFlow and all the way back, and all that within less than, less than 0.38 seconds. Um, and so, the interface itself is, I think, let's say the important thing to highlight, uh, not so much like the, let's say the, the UI isn't really there, but just that that instantaneous feedback and actually overlaying um, data with sketching is kind of a priority of this hackathon. Um, and also it was a very simple grasshopper script, so no spaghetti wires, nothing. Um, that's basically it. Um, this is the rabbit workflow. Go ahead, Peter. Um, for the Revit workflow, we needed um, to get from our Revit data to TensorFlow, so we used PyRevit and CPython. Next slide. Similar to our Grasshopper philosophy, we wanted it to be as simple and clean as possible, so it's just one button on the Revit ribbon. Next slide. Um, the first portion of the code collects all the data with just one room selection. Um, so that is the length of the room, the window area, et cetera. Next slide. And then the second portion of the code calls the trained model uh, and inputs our Revit data to that model so that the uh, user can get the predicted UDI, as you see here. Next slide. So some reflection uh, for the next hackathon or taking this further. We had a lot of fun and we thought, um, it would have been better to integrate a post-processing, um, let's say, routine within the pollination recipe so that we didn't have to download the data back and kind of format it for a data set. We thought about, uh, there was a nice suggestion from Mustafa to make it a web interface, considering that um, actually the Rhino interface is kind of a distraction. Um, we wanted to focus on visualizing the UDI results of Revit, so having that heat map there as well, and thinking about what the, let's say, efficient logical deployment would be. Uh, integrating spatial information, as Ken mentioned, was really important because sometimes the model wasn't aware of where it was, so you get a lot of errors. Um, boundary conditions, and then of course maybe visualizing in 3D, uh, again, in the web interface potential. This was us, it was the four of us, two time zones. Um, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, 
thanks to Thornton Tomasetti, AEC Tech. We had a really good time. This is all our first time uh, at a hackathon. Special thank you for Chris and Mustafa for, of course, Ladybug, One Nation, and generally all their support and patience, uh, not patient. <laughs> and uh, McNeil for the open source APIs and generally the machine learning community, which um, always humbles us. And then maybe just a quick uh, live demo, just to see. Um, right now, this is kind of in, it's in Rhino space. So you kind of have to bear with us with the UI, but it's kind of live, which is pretty cool. It's aware of its orientation and kind of its place. Of course, the accuracy is sometimes off, but I don't know. We consider this a pretty big success given the time. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. That's about it. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Um, we're a little bit limited in time, but if there's one or two questions from the jurors, uh, please feel free. Sure. So, all good? Okay. I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. um, so thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, so I know that this is something you're doing on a daily basis. Can you just give a quick comparison to like, what is the speed of this compared to what your normal workflow is? Um, yeah, um, so typically a UDI calculation, I mean, the, the new ladybug tools are way faster and just awesome. And so um, when I first started doing UDIs or when we first started, it was a lot slower, between five to 20 minutes, depending on the room or the floor. Um, now it's just, it's 0.3 seconds. It's live as you see. So I can imagine that if I'm taking this to a designer, I can give this to a designer, as you saw, it was a very simple interface and just have them draw out their floor plan and have them see the consequences of what it means to, let's say, draw the floor plan in real time. Uh, so it's, let's say time isn't necessarily um, a consideration since it's uh, live, so to speak, or almost live. Um, of course, we don't consider boundary conditions or obstacles or whatever, but that would be the next step uh, in bringing this um, to the users. Yeah, I think another element of time there is the time that it takes for a non-expert to get a sense for the dynamics in a system. And, I, and this idea of targeting the sketch phase, we think it could really, you know, communicate to someone like how, how deep you can make a room before you, it's, you, you can't solve the problem with larger windows. Nice. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, guys. You guys mentioned you used a, a neural network instead of an image-based one. So just curious if you guys could talk through that a little bit. Uh, sure. Uh, without going into too much detail, um, can you go to the slide with the generative name? Um, so a typical image classification takes, takes a two-dimensional um, image and can um, compress it down into a one-dimensional vector, which can then classify whether it's a dog or a cat. Um, but the opposite direction can work where you can take a one-dimensional vector and generate an image from it. You use basically use that same, just that reverse algorithm in order to go from our simple room parameters up to a two-dimensional Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So um, I would like to welcome next uh, the Pixling team, which coincidentally I'm also part of, which coincidentally explains why I'm, uh, why I'm wearing yesterday's clothes. But anyway, yes, Jason, some, some things never change. Um, Okay, let me share share our screen. Nope, that's not what I want to do. Okay.
Well, we are definitely excited to present to you today, Pixeling. We brought together a diverse team across two countries, three cities, three firms, and two universities to um, develop Pixeling. So we live in an age where speed is of the essence and nobody wants to wait for information. We want it instantaneous. We also, uh, in the AEC industry, we are you know, more and more working in real-time engines. So you know, we went from still images, you know, videos to real-time scenarios, but anybody that's worked with those know how, knows how hard those can be to share with uh, clients downstream. So current technology is, is, is a roadblock on the hardware side because you know, if we're trying to share a high-end visualization, real-time experience to a client or an owner or an occupier of a space, uh, we have to dummy it down to make it work on their devices. And so what if there was a solution that would allow us to bypass that um, roadblock? And today we're gonna present to you the, uh, the solution. So who, who would benefit from this? Really anybody that is in the, the marketing or visualization space, you know, we see this as a one-click solution to, to, to share um, models, but we also see it as something more. You know, with, with the, the use of uh, you know, digital twins and being able to bring in IoT data and sensors, and you know, the fact that it's online um, makes it easily accessible for this information. So you know, this is a, a streaming service that um, we will um, present as a SaaS solution. So Pixeline enables real-time geometry in a real-time environment to any device, regardless of where you're at. All you need is uh, internet connection and a device with a screen. And the, the best thing about it is that it's the same experience across every device. Here you can see our first uh, foray into pixel streaming. We have this set up on a local server with a uh, browser integration. So we're streaming that to a browser. Um, in this instance, we're also um, streaming that uh, live to multiple um, screens. And so that's a good way of taking a client through a space. They can follow along. It's a shared control scenario at that point. Um, we also have the option of expanding out basically scaling up to whatever amount of users that we need and you know independent controls i'll tell you it's not easy though so you know working with the unreal engine it was it was fairly new to most of us on the team uh, very limited experience uh we we knew we had a direction we wanted to get to uh, we've been working on open source uh, technology stuff that just launched earlier this week so it's very new um, it's very beta and it doesn't work. So we had to come up with our own solution for, for hosting. And, and, and that was, you know, part of our hack. And so the team did a really great job pulling all this together. And, you know, we had our hurdles, we had our, uh, you know, our, um, Apollo 13 moments, but we made it. Yeah. So, um, on the technical side, I guess half the battle was just getting the existing tech to work and deploy properly. Uh, but we're also thinking about creating a pipeline, uh, that would allow you to export your geometry from a familiar design software in our case, Rhino, just because we're a bunch of, uh, Rhino fan boys and girls, um, to, to, uh, some sort of a cloud environment where it can then be streamed to, uh, any device, right? And once again, just to really drive this home, uh, the value of this is the fact that your device that you're viewing this on isn't handling all the geometry and all the crazy detail and memory. So let Amazon figure this out and you're just enjoying the byproducts of that. So uh, we have our uh, Rhino Grasshopper exporter that uh, pipes the geometry, uh, converts it into a format that Unreal can understand and sends it to a Flask server, uh, which lives on AWS. And then that Flask server knows how to talk to Unreal uh, and basically allows you to load that geometry into the scene. And from there, we use the pixel streaming to show it on any device. And this is our very simple script that we use for exporting the mesh. Uh, the majority of the business logic is really in those two small Python components inside um, that format the mesh in the proper way. And then we're just firing off a web request 
uh, to the server. And this is what we spent uh, most of the night staring at. Uh, this is an Unreal Blueprint, so I imagine uh, most of the folks here are familiar with uh, what Grasshopper looks like. Uh, this is Unreal's internal graph um, programming language, essentially. And um, how do I describe this? If, 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 Houdini's, if Houdini's visual programming interface uh, is like Grasshopper on steroids, Unreal's is like Grasshopper on ketamine. Like, I don't really get it, but a lot of folks seem to like it. Um, so if we move forward, um, yeah, so this is uh, basically the live demo of, you know, we have uh, our Rhino client on the left. Uh, again, we're sending, we're sending all this geometry up to the web. The Unreal Blueprint that you saw previously uh, handles all the business logic of picking up that request and importing it into the Unreal scene. And then we see, the bunny hopping around um, in rather menacing ways. Yes, and that really brings us to the next level, to the next step, actually. So um, we've seen the one two-story building uh, moving around locally on the on 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 a laptop. Uh, but we don't want to only look at that, or we don't want to only move small bunnies around. We actually want to look at big models, uh, full, fully fledged BIM models, uh, cityscapes, urban, urban landscapes, that sort of um, type of big models, pulling in big data and then starting to manipulate that. So, for instance, this is um, a big curtain wall uh, model actually deployed. On the left-hand side, we're actually looking at uh, the AWS instance, so the, the cloud instance um, spinning around the model, so actually running this little server. And on the right-hand side, it's locally on our machine, actually dialing in into a public IP address and just looking at the pixels. But we can still actually control the whole movement on the camera from, uh, from the, the, the browser on the right-hand side and actually do all these manipulations that we've just seen with um, Edwin and, and Sergey's introduction. And really that's, I mean, on the next slide, we, we, got a, we got a diagram really thinking about opening that up because now all of a sudden, the hard work is done on the cloud. Uh, that's where the big model lives, where all of the manipulations, all of the spinning around happens. And we're just streaming pixels to a device in real time, anytime, anywhere. Any device really as well. Um, so not just a browser, but on the next slide, we got a little video of um, doing it on the phone actually. So the, the same environment, but now with the two thumbs, you can actually move around with the camera um, and have the same model and the same instance. I mean, I mean this is um, a one-to-one, -one. there's no scaling of, of the video here. Like it's pretty intuitive and quick. And yeah, that's, that's the whole hack. So actually try it yourself. So uh, it's live at the moment. So we got that big model up on AWS. With this QR code, you will be dropped into that model. One comment to make though is um, the default setup is that everyone has controls of moving the camera, but there's only one actual view streaming. So it might get a bit menace when we all try to dial in with 50 at the same time. However, that is possible. And, and the next step really then is to, it's relatively easy to set up uh, restrictions in that, right? So let's say as a designer, um, we can move around and we can adjust things, but then you give a, a view only uh, QR code or HTML page to your clients, et cetera. So that's pretty easy to, to deploy and to actually scale even further. Um, yeah, as, as Sergey and Edwin, Mention actually the biggest hack was actually getting all of the stuff together and, and going through the steps and deploying it. Uh, so we documented that all of it um, on, on GitHub. Uh, so we used quite a few open source um, pieces of software, plugins, and resources. Um, so have a look and try it yourself, I would say. And I think with that, I'll give it back to Edwin in the room. Thank you. So, you know, we talked a lot about the technology. Business models, this is a complicated process. We're here to make it simple and easy for the end user. 
you know, the one click solution, but we also want it to be robust and in depth with, with the data and the visualization capabilities that this uh, technology brings and the accessibility. And so, you know, with that, you know, we're, we're, we're proud to uh, present to you what our future plans are. You know, next steps obviously uh, include IoT data connection, the auto scaling, the, the permissions access, and the um, independent controls. Also being able, you know, to take clients on, on tours, the UI design, and really just um, having fun with this. So we had a, a lot of fun with this, with this um, team. This is the future, guys. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I've wanted to do this for years. And it's finally starting to happen. And I'm excited for this. So thank you all. Well, thank you for uh, your groundbreaking uh, and wonderful presentation. Uh, if the jurors, if, if anyone online or in person have any questions, we'll also have time for a couple. All right, everyone is uh, stunned. Um, so, <laughs> Let me um, let me see who's next. All right, next up we have uh, best fit. All right. All yours. Hey guys. All set. All right. We are best fit and we are committed to ensuring that your equipment fits where it needs to. This is our team uh, made up of a, a JV of Skanska and Grimshaw. And we also had another special shout out to another team member on our team that you'll see throughout our presentation. So we all had different perspectives of this problem of installing equipment that we were uh, that we came together to solve, but we all agreed on one objective, which is how can we leverage models, LIDAR scans, and floor plans, uh, and routing optimization techniques in order to ensure the people that are installing equipment can do so uh, in the most efficient and safe manner. So the problem we're trying to solve is one that you might be familiar with from our favorite show, Friends, uh, but installing large heavy equipment can be really difficult, and it's hard to know if you actually have adequate clearance to do it. Um, and getting things wrong can be really expensive. Um, sometimes, you know, you might have to, uh, you might have to reorder smaller equipment or you might have to tear down walls and doors. So right now the problem is that a lot of this analysis is actually done manually, you know, with the tape measure out in the field, uh, with 2D markups on a floor plan in, in Bluebeam, or actually using like a Navisworks, you know, 3D model uh, to create a simulation. You know, the other part of the problem is the, generic equipment models that we're using, or even the, um, the Revit files that we're, work, we're working with, they're not 100% accurate. So you don't know if something's actually gonna fit in the field. So our solution uh, is kind of twofold. We wanted to validate that you could actually install the equipment inside the building. Um, and then kind of taking it to the next level, we wanted to actually optimize the route to, uh, to, you know, to minimize the time to install the equipment, um, any potential rework or any damage um, along the way. Um, I think the reason this uh, this project really resonated with, with our team and with others is that you know you could you could utilize it for for design work in construction, but even at home. So now I'll turn it over to Jeffrey, our our CTO. Fun. Yeah. So effectively, the entire project was constructed Rhino Grasshopper, a little bit of C sharp on the side, but it's not worth mentioning, and. Um, Regarding the plugins for Grasshopper, which ones did we use? All of them. Um, so, and deleted half of those afterwards. So the basic strategy is you got two parts as an input. You got the object that you're trying to move, and then you have the floor plan of the space you're trying to move it through. I feed those both into Rhino, automate a process in Grasshopper, and didn't quite get there, but the hope was use Rhino inside so we could actually link this all up with Revit models. Future progress might happen soon. 
a little bit of spaghetti code, throw it out there. Um, next slide. And you end up with something like this. You have two locations, one location representing uh, the starting point in a building and another location representing where you want to get your object to. Labyrinth of corridors, and you want to figure out the best strategy there. What we're looking at here are two of the outputs that are likely to occur, at least occurred in our training set, which is red, meaning there aren't any corridors which are wide enough for your object. It's not going to get there, but it tries to show you a path anyways. But just know it turned red. Nothing's going to happen. In white, everything's good. Corridors work. Your object's going to fit. And we have a path from point A to point B. So on the next slide, um, how did we actually train the computer to understand this? Basically use substrate and grasshopper to kind of generate hundreds and hundreds of artificial floor plans that we could uh, navigate and experiment with, and then started running through each and every one of them. Um, you can see from the previous slide, most of them ended up failing, but it did find some that were actually navigable. And from that, we end up on the next slide, which is the basic strategy of how it went about it. It takes that input from substrate as a starting point, uh, finds all the center lines of the corridors, which was fun. <laughs> it was a pain in the ass to figure out, actually. Finds all the center lines, establishes which of the center lines are actually of corridors, which could potentially fit your object. And then from that subset of corridors, it finds a shortest path. Um, between the start and end point. And so what that looks like as an animation is the next slide, which is basically a little bouncing rectangle going down the path, trying to find the best way. And the reason it's hittering around like a ping pong ball is basically because it's running object detection at each step along the way. So it bumps into one wall and it kind of corrects and sometimes it overcorrects, which makes it look like it's on caffeine. Um, this, Later iterations of this were a little more successful. We got some smoothing to work out, and we were able to plug in an actual PDF of the office. So this is what it looks like if you take the Wall Street Bowl, take it up the elevator shaft, and try to get it to the far end of this floor. Um, the bowl itself has been heat mapped, so I was having some fun after I finally got it to work. Um, so you can see areas shown in red are where it's closest to a collision, areas shown in green or where it's uh, nice and free. So step by step, each phase of the process, it's identifying where it's closest to colliding with a wall and then showing you from scale of red to green where that's most likely to happen. So that was the final output <laughs> for this optimization. Not sure how practical it is. <laughs> We also spent some time thinking about a future roadmap of what this solution could look like. Um, specifically, we did a lot of testing with mobile AR, um, and we basically visualized what that concept could look like, starting with scanning an object. So you'd scan an object similarly to how we did before, but then you could open up the AR app and complete real-time AR clash detection. So instead of running this all through the process we developed, your phone using LiDAR would be able to determine if that object is hitting something along the way. So you're using that AR projection to validate the path before you move something into the building. And then you could export an installation guide highlighting any pinch points that you could then share with the installers. So you would essentially do a virtual walkthrough of that installation before completing that installation to ensure that it would work. Um, we mocked up basically what this would look like without actually building out the solution. So it starts by scanning an object, our favorite chair that we mentioned prior. Um, so you start by scanning your object, and then you're going to go ahead and open up the augmented reality app. And so this is going to ask you for some inputs. Um, basically, where are you starting? Where are you ending? Do you need to add any padding? What's the weight of the object? Make sure that it's going to work throughout that space. And then it will go ahead and calculate and load the best fit. And then once that loads, it'll identify any pinch points or issues that you may um, be presented with as you're installing that. And then you can go ahead and review your issues um, and see what those might look like, whether that's just close within your tolerance or actually not going to be feasible. And that's something that we can then share with our installers um, to prepare before, you know, really large, you know, expensive equipment installation that's going to really help us um, save time and cost and money. We posted all of our content onto our GitHub um, using some extensive Grasshopper libraries um, and then posted everything in our GitHub repo. And to finish, we just wanted to say thank you. 
um, to all of you for hosting us. And um, we had a lot of fun, as you can see, with uh, scanning 3D objects, scanning ourselves. Uh, we did a little tour around the area with this chair and took some selfies with ourselves in, in uh, little 3D models. So thank you. That's all we have. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? Don't go too far. I'm sure there are plenty. Here, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, quick question on the object itself. Um, can you does does it take into account the different ways the object can be oriented, or are you just choosing the the, the worst dimension? Uh, first of all, it's very cool. So just I'm just I'm just wondering is if you had something like the bowl that you could move in that you know depending on the way you're carrying and orienting it would make a difference. Does it take that into account or is it just looking at the basic dimensions and, and looking for clashes in, in, in those dimensions? Yeah, so it does take into account the orientation, um, perhaps not in the most sophisticated way possible. Effectively, what I have done is just run multiple tests on the form of, of the object and then pick the orientation that results in the smallest profile on the ground. So if you projected the shape onto the ground plane, that was the orientation I went with. You can imagine certain scenarios where that might not be the best case if you're taking it up a flight of stairs or if you want to actually change the orientation in certain, uh, around certain corners and not around others. Um, not quite to that level of sophistication, but yeah, yeah, to answer your question, it does account for orientation. And I, although I know you, it seems like you've, you've created this for the challenges of, of uh, builders and others who are bringing in equipment, but you may want to market it to moving companies uh, to kind of pre-think wherever they are in, in, you know, especially in Manhattan and other places. Because uh, 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 it seems like it'd be a good tool for a lot of moving companies and people who are hiring moving companies. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. And next up, we have the folks from Unprecedent. Uh, hello, everyone. We're Unprecedent. Um, three of our team members are here in Manhattan, uh, Ramon, Brandon, and myself, Ryan. And two of us are joining us in Spain and Poland on Zoom, um, Alvaro and Conrad. So unprecedented. Um, so the case study we're kind of thinking of or the scenario is a typical architecture office setting where an experienced designer assigns, is assigned, um, sorry, is assigning a task to an entry level designer. And the task consists of creating a drawing based on office standards and office project precedents. So the scenario would be, these rooms should be organized based on the way we have organized rooms previously. Reference project A, B, or C in our archive. So the designer has no previous experience of the task and no previous knowledge of the office's projects. So the designer uses the tool in order to generate recommendations, not comprehensive designs, based on previous data, allowing for a much faster learning of existing standards and precedent projects in order to open up much faster opportunities for new design solutions. And here's a scenario we're trying to avoid in the future. So this is the tech stack that we use. So we wanted to imagine, again, given that scenario, designers in Rhino, and they got asked, I need you to look up the precedents for how to put the space together. So they would use our tool, it would call a backend. In this case, for the hack, our backend was Python and Google Colab running a Flash server. And we used uh, YOLO, which stands for you only look once algorithm for object detection. And we use a, a new tool called RoboFlow, which allowed us to automate a lot of the training and testing and validation for the training. So we had a little bit of spaghetti on the UI side, but that's fine. We're all used to that by now. And so on the Grasshopper definition side, the user has their objects. So they're designing and they said, I need a recommendation for given this. Uh, query the database and show me some options that are relative to it. And so this would use the YOLO algorithm, go through all of our databases, identify the picture being sent and send it back over to the front end. So as Robert uh, pointed out yesterday in tomorrow, yesterday's talk, uh, ML is hard. So 
on our training set, we only had 342 images. And for this kind of model, you would need probably a lot more, <laughs> probably in the realm of thousands. But so we had uh, in our data set, we had three rooms, four rooms and five rooms, and we split them up 80% for training, 15 or yeah, 15 or 70% for training, 15% for validation, and then 15% for testing. And RoboFlow allowed us to do all the manual labeling of these rooms to teach it object detection. Uh, oftentimes for when you see YOLO, there's like a popular model called Coco, which has a list of like bicycles, um, people, but they had no room. So we had to manually create that data set ourselves. So we got up to around 342. <laughs> so this is somehow, this is uh, showing how the MML started classifying some of these images. Uh, as we fed in the labeled data and it ran validation, it was as effective as a, a toddler and sometimes. <laughs> it would get it right sometimes and oftentimes it would get it wrong. So these are some of the metrics that we found. Uh, the most important metric that I wanna point to is here on the bottom left is recall. So we're looking at a recall about 50%, which means that it, see, it would see the same image and then it would basically at a flip of a coin say that's a room, that's not a room, <laughs> which goes to the point we would need much more training data and time to train the model to get that recall and especially average accuracy much higher. But so that was one of the limitations is again, we had around 350 images uh, where we might need well over 5,000 images. Uh, training time, once we got up to 350, the training time on the YOLO, YOLO V5 algorithm was around four to five minutes per epoch. And so we're able to get around 100 epochs of training time. I would suggest that this would need several thousand epochs just to see if it's actually learning and given the loss function. And then training diversity, we had three, four, and five rooms, but we would want much more bigger diversity of database. But the idea is that any office would have their database that they would internally feed into this algorithm, start getting recommendations to their designers. So again, the intended input and desired output is that what you saw, we have these given boxes. You say, I want to see all the ones that match and given diversity. And it would show them their historical precedents from the office that they've done before. implications. Um, firstly, the ability to rapidly share information office-wide. Uh, second, automated knowledge sharing within the office itself. Uh, instantaneous digitizing of plans allowing for creation of new plans. And then efficient, efficiently generate an accurate archive that is immediately up to date. And that's unprecedented. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. And now I'm happy to welcome uh, Facade Forecast. Do you mind if I share my screen? Uh, absolutely. Right, facade forecast. Uh, Elchin is on the team. He's not in this space this moment, so uh, we'll get going. So I think um, this. I brought this yesterday about facade design. Is um, um, when, when, in regards to embodied carbon calculation, is something that is typically done sometimes in LCA stage, but not early, early, early in the design stage. Um, and so we need to do this now, given our current issues with climate change. So the team is myself, uh, Abhishek and Elchin from Thorne Tomasetti and Andrew Swartzel from Picard Children. Next slide. Um, you know, everybody's seen this now. We probably should have started this uh, 10, 15 years ago, but we are where we are and we need to start doing this uh, now on, on, on projects. So people should know this by now. Um, the, the construction of buildings is a, has a huge impact on the, um, the, the uh, climate um, related to CO2. And so this is a huge issue for us. Next slide. Um, the facade portion, I've seen it much harder than this in, in some studies, but at least this study from, from uh, Letty um, Climate Emergency Design Guide shows uh, that 16% of the facade is impacting the uh, embodied carbon of the structure of the building itself. So the... Um the the problem here is is really kind of twofold um we do have the opportunity let's say to optimize the enclosure for embodied carbon um 
it would be great to simultaneously optimize for operational carbon, but it's a really tricky problem because it, it, anybody who's looked into doing embodied carbon calculations knows that you need a, a lot of detail to get anything that is even close to realistic in terms of an expected um, value of embodied carbon. And you know, these are details, like if you, if you look at that image on the left, that's a Shuko uh, mullion. And that's the sort of thing that you don't even get until, you know, after CDs, the fabricator is, is who's really um, going to be putting together the specifics of, of that, um, that curtain wall system. Um, and then to add, to add to the complexity, even the, uh, the values that exist in EPDs, which are conveniently collected all in the EC3 database, um, those all have ranges. Um, every fabricator has, uh, is going to be reporting a, a slightly different value. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty that's part of this process. And, and so what happens, unfortunately, most of the time early on in the design stage is we've got deadlines and we have to put our blinders on and, and just focus on what we, what we know and what we're able to produce. So what if there were a way to kind of get a, a decent estimate at the beginning? That's, that's where we started. And uh, this is just a, a timeline showing a little bit of the, the work that we did over the, over the last uh, 24 or so hours. And I'll hand it over to Abhishek. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, yesterday I was trying to join a group where I would uh, basically not have to stay up late, but that did not happen. Um, so as uh, Andrew mentioned, we, we explored a couple of options of how we want to uh, wireframe this and also present it. And, and at first we were thinking, okay, we might have a simple enough UI where you, know, you have um, a few sliders, a few inputs, and you would get this one magic number, which is your embodied carbon. And then uh, we were like, wait, but that doesn't mean anything. Like in, in embodied carbon, you're oftentimes looking at relative uh, merits and demerits of different options. Um, so that's when we decided to go with uh, Thread, which is more uh, focused on the um, data aggregation and trends part. And so, um, yeah, the Grasshopper uh, definition definitely had a lot of squiggly lines. And um, like like Andrew mentioned, uh, just get getting the getting the different areas and volumes itself was the task. And then, of course, juggling through a bunch of uh, a bunch of embodied carbon values and 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 and. Um, aggregating um, the right amount of, you know, right amount of apples and right amount of oranges uh, was was the challenge there. Um, but yeah, I think we've ultimately got it to a point where uh, we can compare different um, types of facades. We can compare, um, you know, the different materials in them um, to give you a final embodied carbon uh, figure. Andrew's going to switch over. So I'm going to switch over now to a live view in thread. Um, and this was, uh, Abhishek, how many, was, was it 12,000 items are in 1200. this? 1,200. Or 1,200 items are in this. Um, but that's, uh, that, was, that was kind of optimized and, and filtered down uh, to give us a data set that was, that was small enough to, to view in this kind of brute force manner. Um, there's certainly an opportunity here to train an ML model um, to, uh, to kind of look at an even wider uh, data set that exists. But um, to kind of demonstrate what's, what's happening here, uh, we've got uh, four different wall types, uh, wall assemblies, basically over on the, on the left, stone, metal, curtain wall, and brick. Um, there are, uh, see, it looks like the, uh, there we go. Uh, there's a, a wall height, and this, this was kind of limited um, for the, the sake of speed. Um, and so if, I, if I'm choosing here a 13 foot wall, um, there's a, a window height and a window width, a window spacing, and then a window to wall ratio. 
uh, that can be that can be filtered out. Uh, but I want to look in here and see like what the best performing, the best potentially uh, the kind of wall assemblies that have the best potential um, for embodied carbon. And it's looking like from uh, from the estimates that, that we're making here, um, a metal, uh, metal um, cladding on, uh, on a steel stud wall or a curtain wall um, seem to be uh, offering the most potential. Um, if we look over here at the at the ones that might be performing worst, uh, we have we have again, some brick and stone, um, which might have a, a CMU backup. Concrete has a has a high um, global warming potential. Um, and then, but even here, uh, there there are some kinds of curtain walls that that might be performing poorly. So, you can filter filter these out, uh, kind of explore this design space. So the differential between the highs and lows was about a factor of twenty five x between those facade systems. So. So the uh, I, I mentioned before, uh, it would be it would be great to include uh, U values in this data set um, to be able to compare uh, the potential um, the global global warming potential alongside the U value. Um, if if you're imagining, uh, you know, you you could theoretically wrap a building in a paper bag, um, and that or a, or, a, or a plastic tarp. And that's not going to give you any sort of thermal protection, but it, it might have a pretty low uh, embodied carbon. Um, eventually, uh, you'd want to be able to integrate with this with Revit um, to be able to select a wall uh, with windows, grab all of the data out of that, um, and, and kind of feed that into the same thing. And it would, of course, it's always it's always good to have a kind of cost comparison as well. Questions? Sure, Alex. Oh. All right. Um, I think maybe I missed part of this, but you guys are talking about how difficult it is to calculate the embodied carbon because we don't often know until later in the process. So could you guys talk a little bit more about how you're making those estimations in this tool? Uh, actually, embodied carbon is actually simple to do. What is mm -hmm. difficult is have all the very, very detailed assemblies. And so that's what we, you know, down to the thickness of the, of the you know, the, the mineral wall. So that was the difficult part of getting CD, CD level detail uh, sort of available at you know, concept design, say. All right, thank you. Okay, next up. Uh, Coco. Hi, so we are Cuckoo, uh, which is automated outlier analysis for Revit. Uh, next, is there somebody with this clicker? Do we have? So this is the team, uh, Alex, Sarvesh, Jim, uh, Jen Chang, and myself. And the problem definition is that uncaught errors in models cost real money. Um, so is there a way that you can identify when some feature of the model is likely to be an error without having to hand code or hard code a huge set of rules? And so we turn to this idea of an outlier um, in statistics. An outlier is a sort of data point that doesn't conform to an overall trend. Um, so there's different ways to do that. You could either look at the frequency of something occurring. You could look at the sort of, um, you know, a regression of the data or 
lots of other ways as well. Um, so just viewing that visually, right, you can kind of see that these outliers are things that don't really fit in with the rest of the model, but outliers can be really hard to spot. And even more so when we're looking at a BIM model, right, we have um, thousands of elements, even within a single category, each one has, you know, dozens, if not a hundred or so parameters, and those things can interact with each other in ways looking at, you know, a hundred thousand different permutations of this and that on two axes. And although this hack doesn't use any machine learning implicitly, um, we think that this is an important thing to, to be looking at now as the AEC industry begins its transition into more data science and um, the rollout of ML. We need the ability to clean up our models in a way that makes them ready for that transition. So we found out that we, we wanted to take a quick look at the, I can, uh, we could take a look at, uh, at a quick model just to see what the frequency of these outliers were. So if you look at this model, these are just walls and we're picking on the Revit model, the top offset value. So you can see that the vast majority of walls have a, have a top offset value of zero. That would make sense. And, but you have a handful of, of walls over on the right side that have some really weird top offset values. Now, obviously, quickly we found out, okay, these are outliers, these are different but does that mean they are mistakes? And that's a, a differentiation that we had to start to look at more closely, even though uh, it is likely that a lot of these outliers will be mistakes. So for example, this is actually a chart of the different work sets being used. There's one element on a work set by itself. Eh, probably there's something wrong with that one, one element. But this, but this issue of kind of take, uh, differentiating, differentiating the, the outliers from the mistakes so it was something that we knew we had to, <clears throat> to look into, even though we did focus on the frequency aspect of the outliers. Uh, but back to the point of machine learning, we also found out through this analysis is that there are patterns that begin to come up. So following with the work set uh, diagram, these show the different work set uh, distributions by level. So you see on the top that, the, that there's a, what we call a four column type that on these levels, there were four types, four works that's being used. And on the bottom, there was a three column type. Uh, the idea here is that in the future, we could have machine learning to begin to identify these patterns and begin to dif differentiate outliers from real mistakes. And for example, one of the items that you can see over here on level eight is that it is a three column pattern, but for whatever reason, that center column is a little bit shorter of one of the examples. So that would begin to be one of the things that the machine learning tool set uh, could begin to track down. So with that in mind, this is the workflow that we ended, that we ended up look, uh, looking at and Jim's gonna uh, tell us more about that process. Yeah, so we um, were essentially looking at how do we get data from Revit out to something where we can interact with it and then, um, and then be able to identify those outliers again back in, in Revit itself. Um, so I'll just walk through each of the, the steps. Um, the first being extracting the data from Revit, and, and to do that, we um, used Rhino inside, uh, and then used Hops to send the data to to Flask to a server um, on the back end. I, full disclosure: we this whole the whole thing doesn't uh, connect yet, just because of some some cross origin, blah blah blah. Um, but but the pieces individually are are there. Um, the, so the second step was to identify the possible outliers. And we, we looked through um, working mostly in, in CoLab, but could migrate to, to Python and kind of uh, sklearn it, um, several different methods for, for uh, analyzing and then uh, visualizing the data there, identifying a set of um, candidate outliers to then display back to the user. Um, and then uh, just as a, a a demo of being able to then see that data using kind of Plotly um, in, a, in a front end web app to then be able to highlight, um, highlight the areas that are either identified from those, um, from, those uh, from the, the uh, SK Learn or just through user identified kind of visually, be able to see those, highlight them, identify the, the Revit um, object uh, ID, and then um, send that back to a Flask server, which can be read inside Rhino inside and Hops. Um, and then visualized uh, again in, in Rhino. So you get that kind of pipeline where you would get those kinds of uh, pipeline from, um, 
from Revit all the way back to Revit. Thank you. So we have a couple items that we're thinking of for future development, right? So actually getting the kind of data flow correct. Um, so overcoming that uh, cores, blah, blah, blah. Um, automatic highlighting. So instead of having that little node, we have to kind of copy paste in, it would just come in through hops. Um, remembering a user's input, because there's nothing more frustrating than when autocorrect keeps trying to autocorrect you and you've told it that you don't want that. Um, recipes, so as you start to tease these things out across multiple projects, actually noticing like, hey, you know, work set versus um, wall type is something that's really fruitful to look at. And so we're going to include those as kind of like highlighted analyses um, versus these things are, are sort of less interesting. So, you know, they're not going to be default, but you could add them manually if you wanted to. Um, and then the automatic recognition of, of um, meta patterns. So instead of just doing simple linear regressions or visual analysis, actually having um, some kind of model do multivariable regression or, or something like that to find more complex patterns or, or clustering. Um, next slide. And that's everything. Our code's all up on GitHub. Um, and you're welcome to the script, the Grasshopper scripts are as well. Thank you. Any questions? Great, thank you. All right, we have only a couple of presentations to go. Uh, next up is automating analysis model extraction. Here you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Thornton and Tom Setti, uh, for hosting the AEC event. It's absolutely fun. Uh, this is my first time, uh, so uh, is my, a lot of my team members. Uh, who's joining me today uh, remotely. We have Mona, we have Atharva, we have Daniela, we have Prakia, and then we have Vincent. Um, and Mona is from San Francisco, Atharva is, uh, and Prakia is from uh, Seattle. Daniela is from uh, Boston, and I'm from next door, uh, 29th floor, 140 Broadway. Um, we're all from MBBJ. Um, uh, today, uh, we'd like to uh, present the work that we've done in the last 24 hours, and we're really interested in finding ways to automate analysis model extraction. Um, so the motivation behind this work is a little bit more Yes. Uh, it's a little bit selfish because um, a lot of my time at MBBJ, actually, uh, when I work on projects, I do a lot of analysis. And uh, many of our uh, sort of designers or partners uh, don't quite understand that analysis model are not quite the same as design models or documentations models. So when they hand me those models, it takes a lot of grunt work to clean them up, to rebuild a lot of geometries in order to um, be fed into an analysis workflow. Um, so because of that, you know, because of the time it takes to, to move from design or documentation back to analysis, uh, and then there's all these change of scope during different phases of projects. Um, in general, we, analysis always comes in at the last phase of, uh, of, a, of a design iterations, uh, where we're really doing more of validating the design strategies than really driving uh, design choices. Yeah, so uh, as Vincent mentioned, uh, we want to implement this pseudo model that that takes that takes part in the analysis across different phases of design. So if you have a Rhino model in the SD and you're moving into Revit, you will want to have this intermediate model, which I which we started calling it as a paper model. And the idea of the paper model is it's the most simplest uh, outcome of all the all the geometries that you have that you can use for the analysis. And this this model also also helps because there are times when you're moved into CD or CA and then there's a change of scope where you want to do some daylight analysis or view analysis where the, mo the Revit model is so heavy and it's not made for any, any analysis that the cleaning, pro the cleaning up process takes literally 75% of the time. So you want to have this parallel model happening at the same time, which is automated. So no matter what stage of design you're on, 
you want to keep this analysis model that you can always use for any kind of lead analysis, view analysis, et cetera. And it, in the way it tightens the design performance feedback cycle for the designer and the client when any scope changes. Next slide. Um, so this is, oh, I'm going to move this. Um, so this is kind of our general approach um, to simplifying Rhino or Revit geometries uh, using, you can't see it right there, but using ray tracing. Um, the reason that we're using ray tracing is because I have no expertise in computational geometry, so, but it really bothers me in my day-to-day -day work, so I just take a jab at it. Uh, so thinking kind of like a robot scanning through the room and trying to extract the most analysis pertinent geometries, uh, otherwise uh, is very deep in the, the messiness and the complexity of, of any design or documentation models hand to me. Um, so luckily there is a built-in function in Rhino Common called rate shoot, uh, called rhino.geometry.intersect.intersection.rayshoot. Basically it shoots out rays from any given points you want it to shoot out and you can specify a, a, a set of vectors for those rays to project out and then it's going to return. So right here, um, it's going to return a struct. The, the struct is called ray shoot events. And within that sort of package that it returns, there is the uh, face that your ray is hitting. And there's also the host geometry where that face kind of uh, lives. And then there's the intersection points. Um, so. And for me, I was like 24 hours, 24 hours, that's not a whole lot of time to figure out, you know, this is my first time doing any ray tracing. So I kind of just look at Ladybug. They have a great forward ray tracing sort of component that is completely open source. You can just double click it and then all the Python codes is inside. Uh, and I basically repurpose that uh, to our needs. So as opposed to returning all these rays bouncing around, I return all the services that the ray touches. Um, and by in so doing, um, so here you can see we're testing on a little toy model. We have uh, a bunch of sample points that we're dropping into the toy model. And from each sample points, we're projecting sort of a spherical array of vectors that hits those surfaces. And then we're extracting those surfaces. As you can see, the, mod, the original model comes in with a lot of thickness uh, with columns and curved walls. But when those um, race, uh, when, when we're collecting those intersection the surfaces that are inter intersected by the rays, uh, it becomes just a single plane surface, which is what we want for analysis. Um, the only problem is if you have too little sample points, uh, you're going to end up with models with holes. Um, so luckily, if you simply increase the amount of your sample points, it's going to you're going to project more rays out, and those rays kind of catches, it's going to touch more uh, surfaces, and then those surfaces in turn will become tight, will more airtight. Um, and then another thing is, um, we, speaking of tightening that feedback loop between design and analysis, um, this is sort of show, showcasing that any geometry update from Rhino, you can see sort of the analysis model updates, um, not simultaneously, it takes a little bit, a little while, it's a, quite a computationally um, heavy process, but you can sort of see it update sort of right after. Um. So, so here we're looking at a more simplified way of just taking that information from Revit, um, kind of breaking apart the, the native components of Revit and simplifying them to maybe a point or uh, some kind of value and then sending that to Excel. And then uh, the next slide, bringing that into Grasshopper and, and creating a, a very simplified version of what that Revit model is, which is just a single surface. Um, the room tags create the polyline, so you can kind of understand uh, the parameters of where you want to do the analysis, and then also being able to label it from the room tags itself. So just a more simplified uh, version of um, getting a complex Revit model into Rhino. And I will add to that, there's the, the nice thing about Revit is that it's, as opposed to Rhino, Revit is sort of data rich. The geometry has properties to them. Uh, in Rhinos, you kind of just have to, you know, deal with it other ways. Uh, but in Revit, um, that's kind of what we're trying to do, but um, 24 hours again, not enough time. Uh, so 
because um, certain performance analysis need to have uh, some room specification like a view analysis. So we did uh, this room specification through two ways of uh, automated labeling means that it uh, kind of uh, specified the rooms that are already enclosed in within walls. And then, uh, then we manually add those other uh, rooms that are not necessarily within walls like lobby or any other uh, rooms uh, that are necess not necessarily uh, enclosed within partitions through a manual labeling uh, on the tiles that we create on the floor. Right, and um, so what's this all this for? It's for analysis, right? So we have to test it out. What are we getting out of this? So we fed it into our favorite sort of uh, analysis um, toolbox, Climate Studio, because it's fast. Uh, it is a pay software, but uh, we use it a ton. Um, so we're getting uh, annual daylight analysis uh, out of uh, Climate Studio and then some uh, point, sort of specific point in time glare analysis as well. Um, one thing I like to point out is normally uh, because these are meshes that we're getting out. Uh, so as you can see, the analysis grid laid out here is sort of broken up by those meshes. By the way, those meshes are triangulated, which is not quite ideal. Um, but there are other ways to meshing um, uh, surfaces. Uh, you can use quad mesh, which gives you a nice grid. Um, those are the things that we could explore. Uh, and then we finally uh, decided to take something straight from Revit. Uh, it's a quite a messy model that has both uh, meshes and poly, poly surfaces. Uh, so we're interested in just throwing the tool at it and see whether it's able to extract those um, surfaces that we need for analysis purposes. And as you can see here, if we zoom in a little bit, um, you can sort of see that uh, it's picking up on the curvature of the walls, it's picking up on the columns, it's picking up on all of the glazings. Um, and again, um, we really don't care about wall thickness so much. Uh, so we really try to simplify the geometry, but probably not doing quite successfully here because we're just extracting geometries off of a base model. So that brings me to the next slide. Um, so this whole approach probably is not robust enough um, because if you have some problems in inherent in your base the geometry, say if you have holes in Revit, things are not joined up, we're not gonna be able to fix it. Um, and using ray tracing, again, it's um, computationally heavy, uh, kind of prohibited. Um, so uh, probably there are other ways to extract those geometries out. And uh, also analysis surfaces, uh, when we do these sort of ray tracing into sort of meshes, um, if you have curvy walls, which is you know some more ambitious projects we'll probably have, um, to approximate those uh, curvatures uh, using meshes, you kind of have to get pretty fine meshes. But the way that we project those rays out uh, is that you need a lot more of those rays to be able to catch those surfaces, uh, which again becomes very computationally prohibitive. Um, and once you do catch those tiny little surfaces, it, you know, it, it becomes overly, uh, the, the, the result becomes overly high fidelity, which is not what we want for simulation anyway. Uh, so here are a few, a few future steps that we um, are contemplating on. Uh, one is, let's forget about getting clean, perfect geometry. Let's, um, because it's impossible, because things that designers hand you are often half-baked and things in Revit often have holes. Uh, you either have to do everything manually to get it perfect or you just, you know, so why bother, right? So. Could we find other ways to, to do this? Because ultimately our goal, step, taking a step back, is to try to build a better feedback loop between design and performance. Um, could we take the point clouds that are getting projected onto the geometries and use that? Because each point, you, know, you can embed sort of material information to those points. So that point cloud could become something you can then build a surrogate model on. Um, so that's one avenue that I personally am interested in exploring. And then the next one will be a better UX sort of integration because um, there's nothing worse than building things that no one knows how to use or no one likes to use. So getting to know how designers works and finding out where and when to provide those critical feedbacks uh, in their workflow um, is probably more, even more crucial than the tool themselves. Um, and then lastly, um, all of these computation 
thanks to Hobbs and um, the new sort of development from McNeil, uh, we're, we're, we have the potential to outsource them to uh, servers um, and to clusters of servers um, that, are, that are living on the cloud. And um, so there, there's, there are a lot of possibility to explore here. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, last, but absolutely not least, uh, we have the presentation from Team CRC, who will be joining us uh, through a satellite uplink from the old world, hopefully soon. Hello. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you hear me okay? Uh, can you hear me okay? No? Yes. yes. I'm good here. How about now? Is that better? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Welcome to Aachen, Germany. I'm uh, representing Team CRC, Cloud Remote Control. We were looking at super positioning structures. Um, this is a tough uh, crowd to go last in with some amazing presentations and research over the 24 hours. Uh, our team was spread out all over the world from here in Aachen, Germany. My colleague, uh, Roshi Dai, Ardashir Ali Askari, and uh, a bridge engineer, um, Jonathan Kestelman, uh, from, I believe, DC in Virginia. So uh, we were looking at teaching users how to remotely control robotics using this uh, new plugin called KUKA CRC, Cloud Remote Control. We were um, introducing them to some of the basic concepts of how to parametrically design and execute robotic programs. Um, but, but we started with this challenge where every time that uh, in, my, in the robot lab here, as you see behind me, we try to build these bridge-like structures, we're dealing with large amounts of deflection in the model. So we're constantly struggling between this difference between the ideal digital model and the reality of the physical model. And so what we looked at is, uh, with the benefit of a, a builder and an architect and an engineer is how um, in the architectural engineering and construction world, this challenge is met when um, taking two cantilevers and turning them into an arch. And so there's uh, a lot of industry solutions, thinking about formwork or pre-stressed cables and thinking about how we have to mediate these deviations as we're in construction because so many of our uh, engineering models look at the building once it's built. And I think that in my own robotic process, I need to start thinking about the as-built structural analysis. So we started thinking about how we might approach this using the tools that we have at hand to make a support-free structural automated fabrication process and how we might take the expected deviations during the construction process and anticipate those so that we can adapt our parametric model to go to put the metal where we um, where it needs to go so that it deflects where we want it to go. So we started, uh, we spent a lot of time learning how to use robots and a lot of time then uh, playing with Karumba, which uh, some of us had, in, uh, which we're all a little bit new to. So we had the original structure, we looked at that deviation, we started to reverse that deviation to find a corrected structure and then recalculate that deviation to hopefully find that the corrected deviated structure is uh, in the end where we wanted it to be originally. So we try to anticipate that deviation and kind of lean into that constraint rather than uh, fight it afterwards with more supports or more scaffolding, things like that. We tackled this uh, online from around the world with pretty simple structures, but in the end we were able to, um, well, uh, have from around the world some robot code executed and you can see that there's still deviation but we hope that the deviation is more in line of where we want the finished structure to be rather than placing the metal and then it deviates to some other uh, area. We actually don't know. We would have to 3D scan the structure to do some more um, complex comparison. Uh, the structure that we built, as you can see behind me, is pretty uh, simple, but we do hope to apply the workflow that we've developed um, and kind of this anticipated superpositioning of structures to more complex uh, constructions in the, uh, in the classes that I teach here at the Arbitat Aachen. So many thanks to uh, my colleagues as well. Um, one thing that came out of the inspiration from hearing some of the other lectures is that as KUKA CRC connects the robot 
to the cloud through uh, MQTT networks. We um, had some inspiration from my colleague Roshi Tai, who's been working on kind of uh, Unreal Engine of construction sites, and she was able to hack into this uh, CRC network and start to pull the real-time data from the robot movements to an unreal environment and start to mirror not just in the Rhino Grasshopper environment but in this other unreal kind of world that she's building with this uh, very wonderful robot looking at a robot uh, so that we have now this new connection between uh, softwares. So we wanted to maybe show what that would look like in reality. I hope you can still see my screen. So we have now, this is our model. We can see, if I get you guys out of the way, we have our original structure here. Um, this is our, you know, our deflected structure. We're able to take this, um, these uh, point deviations and then start to build an anticipatory model and then double check with a second level of analysis that we meet that original position. And then we can simulate that and start to see. I think with such a simple bridge concept, the deviation is not huge, but we hope to build much more complex concepts in the future and see much more uh, superposition corrections. And then, ideally, if my robot were awake. One more second. And then we can see the robot jumps into motion. Now I set this up uh, to move from here, but we had previously code coming in from Virginia and DC and from our uh, partners around the world to, to test these ideas and learn about digital fabrication and how our ideas could come out of the computer and into giant robots. So I wanna thank all the collaborators and Torrent and Thomas Study and all the wonderful people that took part in the hackathon. It was a real honor to um, be a part of it. I hope next year we can do it again, maybe in person. That's us. Um, it still works. Doesn't work over there. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for all the presenters and all the jurors. Uh, that officially concludes uh, our presentations for today. Again, thanks to all the teams for amazing, amazing work that you guys put out over 25 hours. That's incredible. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, the jurors are going to break out into separate Zoom meeting. We'll figure out uh, how you guys will join them, uh, those of you who are here physically. And then we'll reconvene in about half an hour and we'll know, um, well, which team won. So um, thanks again and we'll uh, see you shortly. Hello, everybody. Um, all right, so we're back. The jury has convened and uh, deliberated, and uh, we're about to uh, find out the results. So I'll uh, hand over the microphone to whomever will take it. <laughs> I, I guess I'll start. Um, just in case, I'm Jason Lee. I'm the acting chair of undergraduate architecture at Pratt Institute. Uh, I, on behalf of the jury, we had a really great conversation about all the projects and all the presentations and we want to just first congratulate every team because we're all just completely impressed you know alex and i just mentioned like it's incredible to believe that that happened in 24 25 hours uh from not possibly knowing each other to like coming up with a very clear succinct presentation that was amazing i just want to quickly point out a few things uh we really love all the projects and you know i think we were trying to figure out if we could make up new categories but we didn't uh, because there are only three categories. But one thing we mentioned uh, amongst ourselves was that, um, what was it? Oh, yes, straight to consumer tomorrow will be the best fit. Um, we, you know, we all thought that there could be so many applications for that one. Uh, we will all love unprecedented uh, facade forecasting. Um, the automated analysis one, uh, I think we all like that too, and also Cuckoo. Um, the idea of sort of like, you know, I think, what's the new term, Alex? Grammar. Uh, yeah, Contextual grammar checking for Revit models. That would be a really amazing thing to think about. So uh, having said that, I just want to thank you all. And I'm going to pass um, which award, we didn't decide which one would go first. Hmm.
All right. Uh, I'm Alex Pollack, uh, CTO at FX Collaborative. Um, and I would, you know, echo everything. You know, all the teams were did really amazing work over the last 24 hours. So in the collaborative category, um, we chose the cloud remote control super positioning structures. And I think there was a couple things on this project um, that really kind of noted its, collabor its collaboration. One was the team um, kind of being in, in various locations, the ability to remotely control physically um, the, the robot. The idea between the the real and the digital and kind of the collaboration between those two worlds the idea of kind of um, thinking ahead about the deviations and um, that are happening in the real world and um, incorporating that into the digital um, and then finally um, kind of the bringing that into the unreal engine into um, another environment to allow um, more folks to collaborate so congratulations to the team All right, shall we do open source next? Okay. Perfect, thanks Alex. Um, yeah, but I would agree. Sorry, I went to the most appropriate place I can get to with quietness, I, I, which, which isn't obviously that quiet. Um, but when we were looking at open source, you know, one thing is that, that you know, the, the platforms, the tools, the, the libraries continue to expand in our industry. And I think when you look at the opportunity for real open source for us, it's, it's that both sharing, but also the extensibility of the platform. And so when we looked at open source, it was the idea of what, which ones, uh, which, which projects really gave us that opportunity to build a platform that allows us to go into analysis to build on top of it you know the the fact that everything's built on top of grasshopper as a as a core component we go you know you look at that and you say well that is the example of not only sharing but extensibility of platform for multiple use cases and so with that we we really looked at pixelating as this opportunity to really expand to build not just the the base platform but the long term benefit to the the the, the industry you can really see an opportunity for you to build use case, to build new tools for not just architecture, engineering, facilities management, but owners, users, um, and the general public. And so we really love the idea that, that you know, it's, it's not just about open source, plat uh, well, or open source tools, but the idea that as we move to shared data and open source platforms, uh, pixelating was really a, a foundational project that we, we see uh, having a ton of potential in the future. Great. Um, so last, James is going to talk about the uh, the overall category. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so cliche to say uh, like everybody at all the projects were great, but I, I actually really honestly believe that they were all great, and the amount of work that was achieved in such a short time is is really impressive. And I don't I don't think there's a one here that doesn't um, merit further development and, and and an award if we could give out awards to everybody. But you know, the era of the participation trophy hopefully is over. So. To announce the uh, the best overall, you know, I, I, I particular personally, I think we all had our, our reasons for thinking this was best overall. But you know, personally, in, in my role at Gensler, I see how often um, you know we're obviously a very large firm, and I see how often um, really important analysis doesn't get done because you know by the time that part of the project comes up, it's like, well, you know, there's a deadline. And, we use the budget for something else and like it just it just it's easy to fall by the wayside and if we're going to do anything about sort of improving the um, environmental impact and performance of our of our work like we just got to do this work so you know ideas that bring the um, the analytical closer into the hands of the designer earlier in the process make a lot of sense and so with that we want to give the best overall to m luminance uh, we think it makes a, a ton of sense. Um, the, the sketch stage um, analytics, I think, is just a tremendous you know, opportunity uh, for, for the industry. So congratulations, guys. And you know, maybe, maybe you can do a little JV with the uh, facade forecast. So like you, you double click and then you get the facade forecast layer. But, you know, but, uh, great yeah. work. But it was we also uh, the, stuff. <laughs> sorry, it was also the team, I think, that, that showed a, a clear challenge, but also showed a clear work uh, workflow of putting all the pieces together and, and showing a, a nice live demo. And I thought that was quite impressive. Great. Yeah. 
to Cecile, any kind of uh, yeah. remarks? <laughs> well, I think uh, on behalf of all the jury, I think uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to see all these uh, nice presentations. It's been good fun to uh, to talk about it and judge it. And uh, yeah, just want to say thanks for, for involving us. Yeah, I just want to thank um, all the uh, the jurors, obviously, for uh, spending their 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 mornings or or nights um, um, with us today. And um, you know, I will say, you know, it's a huge relief for all the co the core folks because we we've been planning uh, this 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 um this uh, week minute by minute for the last uh, few months. But um, you know, uh, you know, this is a huge event for us, and I and hopefully a huge event for everyone here. Just to learn about new technology um, and and meet people, I think this 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 hybrid um, approach that we took this year um, was really successful and uh, it was an experiment, um, but it worked out really well because we we were able to connect with people from all over the world, as well as our, our friends here in in the New York area or our travel from the U.S. So uh, yeah, hats off to everyone and hope to see you next year or even before that. Maybe we might have another one um, before next uh, fall. So. Um, thanks, everyone.